This is Art History 1, uh, Part 4. Uh, this is the Greek period from, uh, the, from beginning around 900 to, um, I think we're going to go to uh, the beginnings of the Classical period. All right, what we saw before uh, in the Cycladic peoples began right here, and the Minoan people here, there's just this civilizations um, grew out of these small, um, isolated communities um, into a bigger community, which had a, you know, a full society with all developing through trade and becoming prosperous through that trade and creating a, a complex society. Uh, and then I moved on to the Mycenaean age where these people sort of took over and made, made their, their world into this and they continued to develop skills in manufacturing and, and arts and crafts and, and uh, you know, growing, growing uh, olive oil and, and uh, making wine and, and selling them through all the, the areas that they could reach by boat around this circle right here. Um, and then we have around 900 the, uh, what we call the Greeks proper, the, uh, uh, the early Greeks that, that are going to be in, in, in these developed city-states. Zoom in a little. It's not zooming. There we go. Um, Delphi, Corinth, Mycenae, um, Athens are big ones. Sparta is over here. Olympus over here. And so there's the city states are little small countries, but in the, the size of a city. And each one is you know locally ruled, and they have they have their own uh, uh, you know way of running running the, their 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 individual city states. And they're and they're separate from each one. Each one is like a it's almost like cities in the United States, except they're completely um, independent. And but what happens is that because they're all part of one unified culture and one one people, they they do get together and compete with one another in like the Olympic Games and things like that. And they, you know, even people from from over here and you know over here, they'll they'll, they'll come and they'll um, you know they'll they'll engage together as as one people. Though when they go home, they they are in separate states, and they have different governments. Like the one in, in Athens, uh, you may know, is, uh, was a, had a representative government. Uh, it was much, much further ahead in, in so, several things. They developed lots of uh, philosophy and and uh, and literature. And they, they they developed a lot of things that were were so good, so so far ahead of everyone else that they are they are still. Um, um, are still relevant now for the things that they wrote and the things that they created. At the beginning of this series, what we see, what we see is um, there are, is, is in a relatively primitive state compared to what happens later. When we look at something like this, this is a, this is a, a, a it's called a crater. Right? It's, a, it's a great big pot, and they made lots and lots of pots for all sorts of different. Uh, containing purposes, but this one is is a, is a big monument. It's used for uh, like a funerary monument, and and in it, um, or rather, the, the the thing itself was just the, an object to look at and to mark a spot uh, in a cemetery. But it's it's decorated in a, in, a, in a way similar to what uh, regular pots would be used for. You know, like the kind of you put. Um, you know, materials in to, to sell them, you know, across the water somewhere, uh, oil and, and wine and grains and all those kinds of pots. And they, you know, once you make a pot, it has a utilitarian uh, aspect to it, but then you can add value to it by painting it and putting pictures on it, putting decorations on it. And this, this is an example of something where they, we can see what their decorations were like. In this period, it's called the geometricizing uh, period because the the decorations are very geometric. Uh, part are just abstract patterns. Uh, the kind of stuff that uh, like the horizontal lines come from putting the, the pot on a on a wheel and turning it, and then putting a, a brush dip in, dipped in a kind of a slip. That's when it's fired, it will become a black glass glaze uh, on the surface. Um, and and touching that brush to it while it's spinning, you can create these long horizontal lines like that of different thicknesses, big bands like this. And then once you have some, some bands of dark and light and the light ones, you can put you know, more colors and more little patterns and things to, to make it more interesting, give it, give it more surface 
uh, make it more, more interesting. This is a good, called a key pattern. Just a, it meanders. I think it's uh, goes around like that. And all these other patterns, in addition to human figures, which in this case have a purpose because being a fu funerary vessel, it depicts a funeral. Um, the people in it are represented as as if they're 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 abstractions for people. They're just symbols of people, and they're represented as as just almost like letters in an alphabet or hieroglyphs in, in the Egyptian language. They are in a sort of procession, in a, a funerary procession with a uh, a horse drawn carriage, and in the carriage is a some sort of a table or whatever with the the deceased on it. And uh, mourners are, have their arms up in the air with their elbows right here, with their hands over their heads, in a gesture symbolizing grief and mourning and lamentation. Uh, otherwise, the figures are very, very geometric. You know, their, their chests are just triangles. They're, they're, the lower part of the body just has this arch here. Um, there's, it's filled in with darkness, but the shape is a very simplified version of what we saw in the Minoan period, in the Mycenaean period, of the way that they, they render humans there. There, In fact, if you remember that dagger, uh, the, the figures on the dagger, you know, were the, like the, the, the next step below this in terms of, of uh, uh, maybe above this in ter terms of naturalism. Like those had the absolute minimum detail of, of to, to make a person. In this one, these are even, even more simplified. Another thing is that they, between all of the spaces, they fill with patterns, just these, some just abstract patterns that just fill spaces and, you know, for decorative purposes and also because of the, the concept of horror vacui that we talked about before, just a, a desire to not leave any empty blank space. Uh, but this is, this is the, the starting point for, for, for the Greeks with this kind of decoration. We will see examples later how it becomes more sophisticated. It's they add, uh, you know, they, they move in a direction of naturalism and uh, they, they develop an ideal which, you know, becomes so, uh, I don't know, it's, it, it, it's so appealing, so universally appealing that it's still the ideal uh, in society today. It's one of those things that just, just lasts. So, um, in the process of developing towards that, you have what you call what you think of as a, a progression, where it starts here in a primitive state and moves progressively towards uh, a, uh, a direction where, there, where, th where things are much more naturalistic. So people look like people, and things become more expressive. And we'll 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 catalog that and see how it goes. But um, one reason for this is that people were, uh, th this is a society of individuals who compete, compete with one another, and they live lives that, that are uh, much more dynamic. That is, they, that it changes over the course of their lives. They develop skills. They, 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 they risk things. You know, when you're, if you're going to be a, a, a trader and put, you know, get a boat and put a bunch of goods on it and, and take them out to, to sell, that's a, that's a huge risk. And, uh, you know, if it pays off, you know, you get rich. And, you know, living lives like that is very different from the, the way people live their lives in Egypt. You know, it's a much completely different society. They have a different kind of art. Um, and when you have people competing with one another, uh, they compete. One of the ways that they compete is with, uh, with art. That is, one generation will look at the previous generations and think, you know, I can, I can do better than that. I can, I can add some something and do something that makes it more sophisticated, more refined, better in some way. And that's how, uh, over the course of generations, they were able to, in a relatively short time, uh, you know, be, be, you know, make some, make some extraordinary things. There's another picture of the same thing. You can see uh, that this pattern and everything, that much of it comes from, from Egypt. It looks, it looks very much like an Egyptian uh, hieroglyphical thing, uh, although some local things like the shape of shields, this is definitely a, a Greek thing. Uh, the way they render horses is particularly Greek. Uh, the way they render figures, they have their own stylized manner, but it's 
the different a different style, different stylization. So that's 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 the the Greek Orientalizing period, very early. I think that's around in the 700s. Uh, but we're going to see now is the, the next stages is uh, to see what it looks like in in uh, relief sculpture. And this is going to be much much farther along. Uh, this is a a model of what uh, a sanctuary was like. It's a sanctuary is a is a thing that they would have. It would be comparable to like the Temple of Karnak. That is, in, in Egypt, they would have big government um, um, uh, temple complexes. And they, you know, we, we saw how these were arranged with symmetry and, and, and all that, and for big processions. And they, they sort of represent power and permanence and stability and all, all that sort of things that are part of the Egyptian world. But here in Greece, they had these places that were special for one reason or another. This, this one happens to be where the oracle of Delphi was, and they are characterized by you know some sort of special place, like at the top of a hill, they would have some, in this case, a temple, uh, and, a, and a, a, a winding path that goes up from the entrance to that temple, as you see, and it's you get up to the top and you see the see the temple up there, and you pass by all these smaller box-like buildings, and these are these are called treasuries, and each city-state would have a treasury here along the way, and the building of these treasuries were um, something that represents those city states. So, you know, everybody in Greece would have some sort of stake in this place, and they would send representatives and they would build stuff to represent their their place, and they would compete with one another in their their treasury. And so, you know, an earlier one may be very primitive looking, and uh, a later one might look at that primitive one and say, I can make a better one than that and make it a little more sophisticated, and then the next one comes along. And, and, and so on, where you get uh, really a, a, a complex things. And this is one that's along that same path. It's uh, by the Siphnians. Siphnia is, a, I guess, one of, the, one of the Greek outposts, whichever, maybe one of the islands. But they, their representatives here made, uh, made this as, a, as their treasury. It's a place like when, they, when people make sacrifices or maybe you know, give something to the gods for whatever reason, they, they put it in the, in the treasury. And so they needed a box, a container for it. This is one where uh, you know it displays lots of architectural elements that are going to be the, the elements that we see in, in temples later. Um, it has caryatids, which are these figures with uh, that are made out of out of into columns or columns that are made into figures, one or the other, and and it has a, an entablature up here that's similar to the kind of an entablature than the Ionic order will have. But what we're going to be looking at is a, a, a relief that's going up here. This is on the entablature. They were a relief, and you can see that there's stuff going on with horses and battles and people sitting in chairs. I don't know what these are about, but we're, we'll look at a, uh, another example. Um, they were also painted, and here we can see paint applied to it, what it, what it would have you know, reconstructed look to it. Here's sort of what it looks like on the hillside as you walk up, and you would just this would be just one of several of this kind of thing. All right, here's the, the actual relief we're going to look at. It's a, it's a battle scene uh, between the gods and the monsters, or, or the giants, I think it is. And you can see this is part of the original uh, decorative element of moldings that, that go on top. I think this is the bead and reel, this thing here. Uh, and these are, I think, acanthus, acanthus leaves. Uh, but up here is a, a battle scene, and the battle scene is... is uh, you know, similar to the kind of thing that you saw in Mesopotamia, in, in the uh, Assyrian lion hunt. In that, it's a relief sculpture in probably a similar kind of, kind of uh, stone. But it's rendered in a different way. One thing is different is that it's deeper. The, the, the cut is deeper into it. The other one's relatively shallow. But this one, um, the, the figures, some of them are very close to us, some of them are far away. So you have more depth in the physical cutting, and also depth in the representation of space. That is, things are overlapping others in a more complex way, so as to get uh, the notion of, of, you know, more space here than, than is actually being uh, uh, carved into it. You can look in a side view, you can see that it's not, things aren't carved in the round. They're, they're relatively flat, but they're carved in such a way so as to give a kind of an illusion of, of uh, uh, you know that there's more space there than 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 there really is. 
it looks best when you look straight on at it. Um, the the figures, the proportions of the figures are, are, are much more realistic. They don't have the wasp waist anymore. They they look they look most muscular and and full formed, and they're doing stuff. They're they're all moving in a chaotic manner. Some left, some right. Um, this guy here is is being bitten by a a lion, and the lion's got his paws around the front of his leg and down underneath his leg. So it's really got him tight and he's biting to it. But the uh, the man has got his arms or you know, his arm in uh, a chokehold around the <laughs> around that little lion's head. He's even holding his hand on this side to like you know even though he's bit, he's being bit and seemingly seemingly mortally wounded. Um, he also has you know the the capacity to 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 strangle the lion. So that that this is a nice piece, a <laughs> nice bit of it. And, and there's other stuff going on. People throwing spears in the background. There's uh, uh, identifiable, identifiable characters. This is uh, uh, Hercules, I bet. I bet. Um, let's look at some more of the people running and, and, and spears here so, and, uh, and shields. Look, there's four, four shields in a row showing the, the depth of what's going on here. Um, the combination of depth and space and natural movement is, is a progression from what they had in in Mesopotamia, comparing this directly to that lion hunt. The lion hunt is very shallow and most everything is happening in a kind of a, a static world where everything is is still. It's still pretty timeless. Now if you when you think of you know this is something that go, occurs in degrees if you look at the, the lion hunt and compare it to something in Egyptian art uh, where things aren't aren't actually uh, moving at all I guess I guess there, there is some action in that one, but compared to this, this is this is you know this is sort of like a you know a blockbuster movie in in comparison uh, with with you know an action flick with lots and lots of stuff going on and things moving so uh, definitely moving in the direction of naturalism in that sense. But let's see when you look at say this character who's the the legs. You know, he seems to be walking in a way that's not particularly naturalistic, and his and his proportions aren't entirely naturalistic. Um, he, he still has a way to go, and and as we will see later an example of a similar sort of thing, a, a relief that's that's part of an architectural thing, where uh, the naturalism is even greater than this. So this is a stepping stone along a series. Neat looking though, yeah, and it's. Expressions on faces and things, or you know, give the impression that the the artist is really, really communicating something clearly. Okay, uh, let's look a little bit at, at architecture. The Greek architecture is, you know, it's hard to 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 to, to overemphasize the degree to which it is it is influential. It, it's, it's still being used today and it's been used you know almost non-stop from from the time that it was created uh, every every uh, iteration of culture as it as, as civilizations come up they look back in past and say let's let's make our stuff like the Greeks and and when they fall and a new one comes up and says let's make our stuff like the Greeks again and, and it just happens over and over and over and we're still doing it. even buildings made on this campus are, are are using the same, using the same things, so it's it's worthwhile knowing where this came from and what it's, what it's for and what what its characteristics are. Now, this is a diagram of the three basic orders: uh, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. Uh, Doria and Ionia and Corinth are you know three different places, they're three different city states or area. I think two of them are islands, um, and they they each had their own particular style for how to make a a, a uh, uh, a temple, and the the temples, you know, I, I imagine that, that there was some some degree of of, uh, of evolution just to get to these 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 states. But once they got to these states, they were kind of uh, fixed. And so once once they had the the fixed state of okay, this is the way Dork is going to look, and this is the way Ion is going to look, they they continued it on and on. And, and when the when the uh, when the Romans came, you know, they um, again decided, okay, we're going to we're going to keep everything just the way they had it because they they must have done it right. It's a certain proportions of 
of the different parts to each other. Uh, Doric has meta, uh, metopase here and, and triglyphs, they, they don't have that in the other two. They have freezes sometimes in the, in the ionic. Uh, the, the cornice and things, the entablature, this is the whole entablature, is in the, in the Corinthian is much plainer, but it's more elegant with the refinements of, of, uh, of decorations and things. Uh, much more ornate capital. Uh, Ionic is the one with the big volutes. The Doric is plainer. It doesn't have a base at all, but it it, it has a um, you know a circular thing that's, that's very similar to what we saw back in the the Minoan period. the The building we're going to see as a you know a typical example of a of a Doric temple, the the early Doric temple, is uh, is this one. It's in a place called Paestum, P A E S T E U M in uh, Italy, just south of, of Naples. And it's, it's in a place where there's another one next to it. It's a little bit older, and that's the one in your book. But this one is, is, is going to be typical of the, the, of the basic shape of pretty much all the temples. Uh, it's a rectangle in plan. It's up on, a, on little steps that lead up to it. Uh, it has you know, a row of columns on one side on the short side and a row of columns on the long side. The number of columns changes. Different bigger temples would have more columns. Um, the spaces between the columns, that is how much space does a column, inner column, or space, is, uh, varies. In the, as the proportions of the columns, their height to width, the space between them is, is, uh, uh, is varies according to the refinements of proportions, which occurs over time, because just as in everything else, they compete with their temples. Their temples will be, um, you know, they when, once they build one and they make it as perfect as they can, people will look at it and judge it and say, okay, now when we built our temple, we're going to refine this bit and make it even better. Noticing, for example, that, you know, if you, if you like one, one example is, is that when you look through the front row of columns, you see the, the sky through these ones on the ends. But when you look at the ones over here, uh, you're seeing the, the, the building through it. So when you have sky over here and you have building through here, then this columnation, that is the, the, the space between columns, could be adjusted so as to make it look better. And, and if you look at the, the Parthenon, it will have an adjustment to the space between this one and this one and this one and this one that takes into account the fact that one, you will see the sky through it, and the other won't. Other things like uh, when you have a long straight line, it, if you look at it, if you, if you make it perfectly level, it looks kind of like it dips in the middle. It doesn't look like that here. It looks perfectly straight. But uh, when you look at it on sight, just, the, just the, the nature of the perspective as you, as you stand and look at things, it, it, it feels to sag in the middle so that the ones, the Parthenon will, be, will have a tiny bit of, of raising right here. It won't be perfectly straight. In fact, the Parthenon doesn't have any straight lines. All of everything is curved a little bit. And, and hardly any right angles at all. And they're just, everything is adjusted and to, to make everything have a kind of a perfection which fixes the problems that they would see in these older temples like this. Um, um, the way we see this here, it's all, it's ragged and old because it's very, it's very ancient. But these would have been gleaming white and perfect and just, and just marvels to behold. And they were meant to be beheld from uh, from the outside, people would walk around them and look at them, and the way the the uh, the way they would use them in terms of you know and actually have a, a ceremonies and, and you know whatever whatever the the uh, sacrifices and things that the priests would do rites and stuff uh, they would be outside they wouldn't be inside the temple. The inside of the temple is to hold the treasury and to hold the the uh, uh, the statue of the of the god or goddess inside. And and they would they would, you know, priests would be allowed to go in there, but the public would be on the outside, and so all the emphasis of its decoration and its and its refinements and the beauty of it is meant to be appreciated from the outside. There would be sculpture up here, and we're later going to see uh, the way sculpture is dealt with when it's in these pediments up there. Okay, so that's the that's the Greek temple. Now let's look at what they do with uh, uh, figural sculpture.
This is called the Met Kuros, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has this uh, uh, Kuros figure. It means Kuros is a young man or a boy. And uh, they also did uh, female figures like this. Female figures were, were goddesses and they were, uh, they were all clothed. Only the, the males were nude and the males could be images of goddess gods like Apollo, say, or they could be uh, representing just an ideal figure. Or it could be that they represent a particular athlete who was very good at something. So, but we don't know. It's, it's, just, it's just a standing male figure, idealized or according to an ideal that they had at the time, before it was developed into the ideal which we, we know as, you know, the, in the classical period. So anyway, when you look at this, the, the first thing that comes to mind it's from, from this class is that it looks very much like uh, something we've seen already. This is the, the figure of Menkauri, uh, part of the pair that we saw, Menkauri and his wife, from the Old Kingdom Egypt. Whoever made this work had not seen this work. This is, this is something that was, was made and put into a pyramid and would have you know, been lost to sight for, for thousands of years. But ones just like it uh, would have been visible. They probably made lots of them as public art outside of temples or you know, within a city just to show the power of the king um, all over the place. So this was a common uh, pose. And when the, the traders from, from Greece went, you know, they saw this and they thought, you know, they were impressed with it. But the reason this is the way it is, is different from the reason this is the way it is. Because there are two different cultures. And the, the culture, the, the later culture, the, the Greek culture, is not copying this one because they have that this represents a ruler or that this, you know, we're representing the power of a ruler and the power of the state. They didn't even have that in the, in the, in the Greek world. What they had was uh, a desire for excellence in human excellence and individual excellence. And so they would uh, you know, compete in sports, compete in war, compete in on all sorts of, of, of levels, even in literature. Uh, and, and, and they developed ideals, and they, when they decided they wanted to make it an ideal figure, they had as a model this pose. And they, and they you know, it's still, it isn't quite as sophisticated as this, because this is made by people who are, you know, didn't have the, the hundreds of years of development that this one took. They were just sort of starting almost from, almost from scratch, but they had this to look at. And so you can see very similarly, so, many similarities, the fact that the, you know, the, 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 the back leg, the, the, the right leg is, is, is stepping back a little, the other leg is forward, but the weight is even, evenly distributed so that the body is exactly symmetrical, hips are level, uh, shoulders are level, arms are straight at the side, hands are made into fists, everything is perfectly frontal, there's no, uh, any, nothing is outside of symmetry. It differs in that it's um, um, the Egyptian one is still connected to the stone, and this one isn't. Here, this is carved all the way around as much as they could, even between the uh, elbows and the waist. You can see that they've, they've, they've cut away some, but it's still attached right there. If you can zoom in a little, you can see that it's attached uh, still. I have another picture here. Um, because, you know, you, you, the, the more you cut carve away here, the more possibility that this is going to break, and as we see, it did break, and it's been fixed. But um, many of the, of the qualities that it has uh, are, are that differ from it have to do with the kind of, that is stylized. Stylization is different from naturalism and, and, and idealism, because stylism, stylization is, is where you take something and make it in the direction away from, from nature into some sort of almost like a symbol. And when we saw the, you know, the figures that are turned into symbols in the geometric period, I mean, those are really, really symbolic. And uh, when you look at even the cycladic figures, you know, those, those stylizations are very, very far removed from actual human figures. So in comparison, this is much more naturalistic. But there are still things like the shape of the head is, is not really like like a human is a little bit long than it ought to be, and this, the proportions here just don't look right in terms of any human being would have this. The shape of the eyes, the, uh, 
in the way the eyes are set into the skull. Just don't, don't look the way natural eyes do. When you look at this one, this, the, the face is much more naturalistic. In fact, it looks like a particular person. Um, but still, the eyes are not quite in their sockets the way we're going to see when naturalism becomes a, a thing that they, a goal that they really strive for and they actually attain later. Not much later, this is like 600. They will get in the classical period and then the 400s. So it's just, it's not very many generations away. Um, geometricized hair. Um, the, 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 the difference between one part of the body and another, like the pectoral muscles here, looks more like a little line rather than an actual, uh, you know, the way, the way people actually are formed. You know, like this, this little clavicle thing here. Well, the classical clavicle is actually kind of natu natural, but that the division right here looks pretty linear uh, rather than the way it actually looks on a person, which is this way. Um, let's say the arm. This arm looks more you know, like they've looked at muscles and things in arms, much more so than this one. Um, the knees. This has this weird kind of abstract knee with a square here. This is a little closer to nature, but this sharp shin, it looks like they got that from here. And the fact that the, the ankles are, are wide and, you know, weird feet. You see the feet are a little bit na more natural, but you, you can go point by point and say, okay, th this bit is a little more natural than that, or it's more symbolic than that, or stylized than that. Um, overall, the, the Greek piece is, is uh, the proportions are, are, are off, the, the uh, uh, surface uh, modeling is off, you know, when I say the word off, in the sense that it, if, if, you, if, they were, if they were trying to attain perfect naturalism, they missed it. Uh, if, if they were trying to attain the degree of naturalism this has, they, they're, you know, they're closer than before, but not, not, they're not there yet. But one can, can say that, you know, whoever made this wasn't, you know, they weren't after this exactly. You know, they had their own ideal and their own thing, and they're just using this as a model for the pose, say. Uh, but for whatever reason, this, this is, this is the, the, the state of the art for the Greeks at this period, in the early archaic period. And this will be our story, starting point. From here, it moves in the direction of... Of, of a kind of naturalism that um, um, that we're more familiar with. This would be the next step up. This is not on your list, but I just to show you what uh, the next step up would look like, where um, the figure gets more muscular. It it feels fuller, like it like everything is 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 made to look more like the the corresponding part in the real human body. Though the face still has kind of a primitive look to it. Even the the, the eyes kind of look bulgy. But they're trying to look, make an eye in a socket, and they're trying to make a face with cheekbones and stuff. And you can kind of see that there's sort of almost like there's bones underneath. You know, the the, the rib cage kind of looks more like a rib cage compared to the way it looked here. So um, as each generation, you know, re revisits this this problem of how to do a human figure, they they get the uh, uh, they they you know, look at a human figure and, and, and say, oh, we could do this better by doing this and this and this. Uh, but why, why have a figure like this at all? I mean, this, it, it, it's, since in, in the Greek worldview, you know, uh, man is the measure of all things. It, humans, and especially individual humans, are, are, are what everything is about. Their whole culture is, is, is around, uh, is centered around humanism. And that, that, you know, humans in the society, uh, they, their their philosophers are are working on the problems of you know what's the best sort of society to live in, what's the you know for morality, um, cosmology, all sorts of stuff that they that they would think about. And when they're thinking of of, of the ideal, if you look think about Plato and his 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 his, his ideals that he talks about, um, this is a a representation of what they think of as the ideal figure, and and when they when they have competitions and sports competitions and and things, you know they 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 look at the human figure and they say, well, what's the best, you know, what's the best figure, say for a runner, 
or for a weightlifter or a wrestler or you know any other of the of the sports that they have that they compete with you know because they they're always looking to strive for perfection for for uh, um, you know to 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 try to have on 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 earth something that is perfect and this is the state they're in at this point all right they're, they're doing the same thing with temples and this is I'm going to show you that this is an example of if you have this in your book of what the inside of a temple looks like and how it's put together. It's 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 pretty. It's more complex than just you know a box with with uh, uh, columns around it. But that's that's what you see here with all this other stuff inside. I'm going to show you the figures that are going to be in the pediment. First, let's look at a reconstruction of one of the pediments. Um, it's a it's a battle scene with. Uh, the goddess here, I think it's Athena, um, which who's you know big enough to be in the center. Notice this, and because of this odd format, they things have to be modified so as to fit into this format. On the ends here are dead or dying warriors. This is the one we're going to look at on this end of the of the pediment, and on the other end, uh, the one we're just looking at was which one was this one. <laughs> And the one that on the other end is this one, uh, and just these are the pieces that are left. We're going to be looking at this figure and this one over here for the two different pediments. The first one is a dying warrior, um, um, and because it's lying down, because it's to fit inside that that part of the triangle. And this looks very similar to the Metcoros. The, the face is kind of similar. The body, the fact that it's kind of stiff. Even though he has to be in this pose, if that met Kuros were to, you know, to move into this pose, you can see you could see that, you know, his 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 chest, the front of his chest, is sort of in the same plane as his abdomen and his hips. Uh, unlike what we're going to see later, where there's a twist, and you can't imagine this one twisting because, you know, they they haven't. That's that's a bit more sophisticated. This is um, has the same degree, I guess, of sophistication that the, the met Kuros has. Uh, it's kind of an awkward leg over here, and um, it's it's been pierced with an arrow and is holding the arrow. But the ability they didn't yet have the ability to make expressions on face that match the action. Um, but this is further along than the Met Koros. I mean, uh, uh, the the musculature, the the fact that you kind of see the bones underneath the skin, so that they are understanding the structure of a figure more. And you can imagine that the artist who did this was was, you know, showing off the degree of skill. He's doing something uh, much more difficult than the Met Koros was, because you know it's the left and the right arm, for example, on that one are, are perfectly symmetrical, whereas this one, one arm is doing a different thing than the other, and you have to have balance. And this this has to look as though weight is on this arm, and and you know there's lots of the problems to solve, even even for this degree of change from the other one. This one, on the other end, uh, is even farther along in, in towards the degree of, of naturalism. Uh, it has a twist, so that the this this part of his chest is is facing a different direction than his hips, and just that twist gives it much more life and more pathos. Since it's a dying warrior, he looks like he actually is you know holding himself up by his arm here, and he's and he's dying, and that the weight of his body and, and the weaknesses coming from him about to die is. Is uh, overcoming him, and so he's, you know, you can feel for him because that's that's just the nature of of, uh, of battle. But you know, having heroes die in battle is 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 part of the story, of, of the Greek story, and uh, uh, and they they celebrate that along with the, the victories as well, and and dying nobly is 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 part of their is part of their culture. So having a representing somebody. Uh, being defeated is 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 just part of the is part of the the package of the whole heroic uh, uh, worldview. But it's also uh, uh, by making the the fallen warrior, uh, uh, you know, an enemy, say, as as more heroic, stronger, uh, and you know, of a loss to have lost you know, this 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 soldier. Um, you know, makes the victory greater that that it, that it costs so much. Anyway, so we you see the different different you know degrees of 
of naturalism has increased a bit more uh, in order to get, you know, the way that this twist in the arm, you know, the, the way the muscle is is uh, rendered right here, and the the vein in the arm, the different little muscles here in the in, in this forearm here, and you know all the little things in the knee. You know, we've 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 moved along a, a long way in 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 the in the progress towards naturalism. Oh, one other thing that I was going to mention. If we go back to the Met course. Why is he nude? Uh, and, and nudity is a, is a big a big part of this, and um, it's almost you forget about it because you just expect. Well, it's one of those things about about the Greeks that they, their their statues were nude, and uh, when the when the Renaissance artists you know resurrected Greek art, you know they made nude stat statues as well, which was something that was would completely otherwise would be foreign to them. These are you know Christians, and Christians don't don't usually most of the Christian art for the whole medieval period is very rarely showed any kind of nudity, you know, even with Adam and Eve, they just they were really reluctant to, to, to have anybody nude. Uh, but once they decided to bring back Greek and, and Roman art, um, they just saw, well, that's just part of that deal. Um, well, why was it? Uh, you know, the reason, you know, even the, 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 the Egyptians, you know, the, the, there's this, they have clothes, uh, which represents the, uh, the pharaoh. This is these are these are accoutrements to to, to identify this as a pharaoh, but um, you know they didn't they didn't show nude figures you know hardly at all either. Uh, so why would why would the Greeks do it? It, it has to do with um, with their idealism and their the religion was that uh, the ideal state that a person was in is the nude state, and when you go before God, you you go before God nude. So the it's it's like the it's the formal dress in 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 the Greek society. They would they would uh, the, fight wars and do their their uh, what else the, the sporting events would also be done nude. It's just it's just uh, when you're doing something special and that you dress up specially for it. And, and in their case, dressing up special means being nude. And so, and it's the body itself. Is as as something that is to be celebrated as a as a as a special thing and examining and 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 reproducing exactly how the body moves the proportions of the body and also comparing one body to another that you know if if you look at different athletes uh, you know they have different body types like say uh, you know a, a long distance runner looks different from a, a sprinter and sprinters look different from um, wrestlers and weightlifters, they all have a different ideal for that particular sport, but what would be the overall ideal? You know, there's a certain, uh, uh, you know, waist to shoulder uh, proportion and head height to the whole height pr to, uh, proportion that when you see a person who's just perfect, um, then you know, okay, that's the, that's the ideal. And even if, you know, in that, when I, when I described about, uh, uh, you know, trying to find a perfect apple. You know, it's uh, you can never find a perfect one because each one has a has some flaw to it. But if you, after seeing a bunch of them, you notice, well, if you could combine the the good qualities of this one with the good good qualities of this one and this one, the other one, then you would get a perfect apple. Well, that's that's what they would do with a perfect figure. But which is perfect depends on on the culture, and and in this culture, their idea of what is perfect evolved over time until they got to an ideal that um, once they arrived at it, that's, that becomes you know, like everybody's ideal from, from then on, even, even till today. I think when uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was, was doing bodybuilding uh, to become Mr. Universe, he looked at Greek sculpture to, to make his body as much like a, a Greek sculpture as, as possible. So anyway, let's go on to uh, face paint. This is uh, uh, an amphora pot by Exequius, and this is a ceramic pot that's made of terracotta, and it's glazed with a black glaze. Uh, when you when you after you fire the pot and and made the made the solid you know the permanent solid terracotta vase, you can glaze it by painting on with a slip made out of water and you know, some chemicals, minerals, whatever it is that you put together um, that when it's fired in, a, in an oven will turn black. 
and you can paint that on uh, like paint and it dries and you can scratch it off so we have an example of what it looks like when you know solid black here and other places where the black has been scratched off into little patterns and I don't have a high enough resolution picture to see exactly how those patterns work but it's very intricate you know lots of little star patterns and uh, floral things and things that represent armor the lines of the armor and everything Sorry. are all I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, are, are making patterns you know, his eyes are made or you know like you can imagine that being scratched off after it's been painted as a solid shape this is Ajax and Achilles playing dice or drafts as it uh, mm -hmm. sometimes called um, and it's got you know two figures painted in black and, and, and etched to make these patterns uh, sitting on these black squares and they're in the midst of battle where they you know there's a lull in the fighting where they can stop and wait uh, for you know things to commence and they they spend their time playing a game and whatever the game is involves um, maybe rolling dice or whatever where one says the number three and the other says the number four and the letters come out of their mouth in the direction uh, and whatever whatever game it is, four beats three, so that Achilles is the winner. But we know from the story, from the Iliad, that, that Achilles is soon uh, going to die, and that and Ajax is also going to die as well. So there's there's pathos here. There's a poignancy in, in the fact that there this is this is you know one last moment of, of fun, I guess, before before uh, the big push, the big heroic ending. When the Greeks, uh, you know, when they painted these faces, you can imagine there's an evolution of, of, you know, towards a more sophisticated style from a less sophisticated style. We're not, see you know, the, the, the one we saw previous to this was the geometric size, was 100 years uh, before this, or some hundreds of years before this. And, and so we didn't see the, the evolution up to this. But even for a, a given artist, uh, um, they would, you know, do many of these things over and over and over, and they would refine them and make them, you know, perfect you know any flaw that one might have until you get to something like this where it's just it's, this is absolutely perfect it's just it's, it's, a, it's a gorgeous face it's in the I believe it's in the Vatican but look how it's designed um, the spears uh, make lines uh, that, that, that run into the handles and the handles also run into the shields here so that the parts here are relating to each other. That is, they, 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 it feels as if the, the picture fits within the, the shape of the vase. Uh, the, sh the vase also swells right here. Um, the, 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 the shoulders of the vase are, are swelling at this part, and right where the backs are bent. So this roundness that you get here is part of the roundness of the vase. And this whole arch here that the, the two figures make connect them together as, as, as one shape. And, you know, the, the, sh the negative shape inside is also being designed, and all the little spaces here are being designed in, in such a way as to make the figure and the ground relate to each other as positive and negative. And, and you know, this, this is one of the, the solutions to the figure ground problem, and as we see, you know, in the whole history of art, the figure ground problem is the is, is the major problem that most visual artists deal with. Tessera is the word here. Uh, Achilles is written here. Uh, Ajax is over here. And I believe the name of the artist, Exetius, is over here. Um, the artist also made the pot. So this is just a, a beautiful, beautiful example of, of, of the, a Greek vase painting. Uh, and if you look at just another one of the same story being told, uh, you can see that they're not all entirely successful. This one is a, a plainer version of the one we just saw. It's not does not decorated as much, and it doesn't look as though it doesn't seem to have the poignancy. It doesn't have the the refinement. The 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 spears don't go into the uh, the handles like the other one did, and it it feels it feels a little awkward. You know, it feels like a a cheap knockoff compared to you know, the real thing. So, uh, um, you know, they're always competing with one another. Okay, let's look on to going, going back to sculpture. This, the, 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 the vase was part of the archaic period, and this is 
a sculpture from the early classical period. In the classical period, uh, we're doing something different. Now this one, I, I see, I know it, it's broken, and so you don't get to see exactly how the arms were in the, or the feet were. But there's enough left of this figure to see some some innovations that the other one didn't have. Just just immediately you look because the the surface of the 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 body, the muscles, and what appears to be you know the 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 bones underneath the skin, you know, the where there's a little protrusion here for the um, the rib cage and the pectoral muscles, when the the way they blend from one to another, the way the shadows fall on it, just the little the little indentation there for the abdominal muscle and the separation between these two, uh, the way the navel looks. Uh, if you just if you put this one side by side with the Kuros figure or or any of the earlier ones, you could see. There's many, many innovations towards naturalism that you have here. Uh, that, as I as I said, this is a, a progression from one thing to another, and this is along that way. And so we, every one that you see that is later, has more naturalistic elements than one that's earlier. But the big innovation here is contrapposto. Contrapposto means putting all your weight on one leg and letting the other one not have the weight. So when you do that, it causes this hip. To be a little higher, and so this hip is a little lower, so it changes the symmetry of the body. There's kind of an angle right there, uh, and later we'll see it even more exaggerated. And the consequence of this is that the shoulders will 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 tilt, and the head will tilt in relationship to it. And here we see that you know that it creates a kind of a twist in the body, and that it, and it makes it uh, much more natural. It's no longer standing like a soldier standing at attention. But it looks like a natural um, at ease pose, and when you when you have that, it's 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 much more difficult to do to pull that off to make it to make it work because you know everybody knows what a human body looks like, and everybody would know if there's anything wrong with it, anything about the proportions, if it if the weight isn't distributed just right, um, if the symmetries are are off, you you would see it. But these. You know this this figure looks looks as, as perfect as it could. Uh, the surface the surfaceness of it the the shapes of it the weight of it all all seem to look just right uh, in terms of of uh, just even that little bit there the little muscle that's sticking over here and uh, you can you can imagine them you know looking at this and saying you know how much better it is than than earlier versions and that. And you know, heaping praise and and, and rewards on the uh, on the maker for having done this, because these are these are this is a society that rewards you know excellence. The eyes are drilled out so as to put some other material here, here just like uh, the eyes in uh, well, that first face we saw. What was it? The uh, Akkadian ruler, you know, with some some contrasting material, probably something whiter for the eyes and, a, and an inlay of some other material for the pupil. Uh, but just the, the, the shape of the eye socket and the, the eye within it is much more naturalistic than we saw before. It's still not completely there. And if you look at that eye, it's, that's not exactly the way eyes look. And, and we will see later that they will get, they will get you know, closer to nature. But as they are here, we are, we are only you know, some steps away uh, from the from the earliest primitive eyes that we saw. Critios boy is the name of this one with a K. Critios. Uh, um, the hair. Oh, I forget to point out the hair is also much more. I mean, it's it's still made into these masses, uh, but it's but it's it's not geometricized the way the 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 one you know, the Kuros figure was. You know, it it, it has a more. A, also in the hair, it's moving towards naturalism. The shape of the jaw, the shape of the the cheekbones, and things. Uh, the the archaic smile that we talked about before. It, it's still a little bit there, but it's moving towards the actual shape of of a, of a normal human mouth. Okay, the next figure that we're going to see is 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 the next step in line, but it's it's made of a different material. This is this is bronze. It's called the Riace warrior. Uh, there are two of them called the Riace warriors, and they're they're almost identical to one another. And they were found um, in the Mediterranean near a place called Riace. That's why they, they named it that. 
um, I'm, I'm, presumably this was made in some foundry and they, uh, uh, in, 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 in Greece and they put it on a boat to ship it to whoever bought it and the boat sank and uh, that's why we have it. Uh, really because if, if it had existed, if it had made it to wherever it was going, they would have sometime in the, in the intervening centuries, somebody would have melted it down to make something else out of it because that's one of the things you can do with bronze. It's a very valuable metal and it's difficult to, to mine it and smelt it and get bronze. So if you have already bronze from something else, it's a lot easier to melt it down if you want to make something like, like say, cannons. Uh, later, when, when cannons become very important, was, you'd melt all sorts of bronze things down just to get to get that to make a cannon out of it. Um, so, had it not been for the fact that this was lost to whoever bought it, uh, we wouldn't have had it. But some diver found it. Uh, found you know, look, saw there was a an arm on the bottom of the seabed, and he pulled it up, and it was a it was a full size human figure. Um, here it is from the from the back and the front, and you can see. The let's see the the uh, the contrapposto is a little more exaggerated. The weight here on one leg, uh, and the this is called the engaged leg when it has weight on it, and the other one is it's free. You know it, it has a little bit of weight on it, but it's it's mainly causing the hips to sh to change, and the the shoulders to change, and this one even has a kind of a twist in the body. You can see that you know that the this hip is a little closer to us, and that this this shoulder is a little closer to us than this one. So that there's a, a twist in the body, so that you have a little s s curve, which makes it look more alive. You know, the 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 Kuros figure standing at attention didn't really look like a living person. It, it was still kind of had that sort of symbol of a person. This you could mistake this from for a real person. And the proportions and the and the articulation of all the muscles and the bones and everything seems to be. You know, very, very close to a human body. If you ever look at, you know, uh, the, the the kind of you know, muscular people that are, you know, that compete for things like Mr. Universe, like the like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger did, and uh, you know, when he won his award, um, you know, they, they look like this. You know, the, the articulation of muscles. If you if you do certain sort of exercise, you get pectoral muscles that look like this, and abdominal abdominal muscles that look like this. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Three Hundred. Uh, all of the, the actors in it are, are made to look like this. And, uh, I understand that they were unhappy with having to do the exercises necessary to make themselves look like this, uh, you know, every single day for, for a long time to get themselves, you know, in perfect uh, physical condition uh, to, to have this look. It's very difficult to achieve. Um, but it doesn't mean that any particular person in Greece looked like this. <laughs> they but they knew from, from looking at lots of people that, uh, you know, if you take the best part of one and the best part of another, that you, you can assemble what would be a perfect person. Um, and because you're working in bronze, you have much more control over things and you have much more opportunities to do things that you couldn't do if you were made of stone. For example, arms that do stuff, you know, that are, that are out to the bot outside of the body. Uh, I didn't mention this, but the Critios boy, he has this little little spot right there. Um, there's another one here, the little spotlight. This is where the arm was attached. This arm, um, it, it eventually broke off, as we see, it's not there. But when it was attached, it was it actually a bit of the stone was attached to this arm to, to help hold it on, um, because you know stone is brittle and it breaks. But you know here, when you're dealing with with uh, uh, with bronze, you can make something that is that is. Um, um, you know, you have to. You don't have to deal so much with balance and with bits sticking off that might break off, um, like like especially arms and legs and and heads. And you know, another thing about a, a, I didn't mention also about stone stone sculptures is that once you make it, it has to stand up. And you know, when you're carving things, you know, you, it's kind of hard to tell exactly if you take a little too much off of this bit and, and not enough off of this bit, then this will be heavier and it'll tip over. And it's hard, you know, you don't want it to tip over, and it's hard to balance one. But with bronze, you can, you can fudge it. You, it doesn't matter because you, the, the, the metal itself will hold itself up easily because it's, it's, you know, hollow, and there's a lot of tensile strength in, in the metal. Well, let's look also at the face. Um, 
because the face, well, this has a beard. We didn't see a beard before. Um, but now uh, you see the way the eye works. It has, they, they, they made eyelashes. And they, they have an inlay of some sort of material, probably either a stone or an ivory or something that goes in their eyes. And whatever was in here must have been a colorful thing, like a good bit of lapis here to put to, for the iris and maybe another you know, bit of onyx or something for the pupil. They could have made this really, really look like a real person. They even they have a different color. They put copper, a contrasting color for the lips. And let's see, what else? Here's a, they even have teeth. They have silver teeth in there. So they're really, really <laughs> moving in the direction of naturalism to try to get make it as real as possible within uh, a scheme where they're trying to make it uh, perfect and according to an ideal. And uh, when, you, at, at, when you get to this point, ideal and idealism and naturalism almost sort of converge, but you have to remember that in the real world, people aren't perfect. And, and, and so to make something that is perfect isn't in itself a naturalistic thing in that sense, because you, know, you, you can't find any perfect human being. Um, but imagine what it would be like if whatever your ideal is of a, of a perfect human is, if that actually existed in the real world and you're making a naturalistic representation of that. That's what's going on. So, so the beard, uh, they're not trying to make it look like the way real beer, beards work, because you know, it's kind of hard to do in bronze, but they abstract it into these little coily um, shapes, these spirally shapes, that, are, that have a, a wonderful creative um, of, uh, uh, asymmetry, asymmetry to it. It makes a nice overall pattern. If you compare this beard to the beard of of the Akkadian warrior, which is all perfectly symmetrical and irregular uh, and nothing natu natural about it, uh, then this looks much more, more natural. Uh, but if you actually compare this to an, a, a real person with a beard, uh, you would see that this is a bronze beard and not, and not a real beard. Um, but, but that means that, that they, you know, whoever made it, had to make up something that looks and can read as real uh, tresses of, of whiskers, uh, which are, you know, wonderful. There's a variety of spirals. This one spirals this way, and this one spirals this way, and they're, you know, each one is a different thing. You know, it it, it requires a lot of a, a, a lot of creativity to get something like this to make this happen, and it's a you know, a beautiful example of it. I think the uh, Akkadian ruler had a similar sort of headband with hair coming out, but this looks much more natural and flowing and and uh, and alive. And and I guess that's part of the part of the of, of the deal is that they wanted this to look like a living person, a real person, as if as if there's bones underneath the skin pushing out uh, to make this shape. I think this is uh, another one. This is, there's two of them, and this is the one uh, that does have one of the eyes still in it. I think it's it kind of a bug eye there, but and this is a different kind of beard. Otherwise, the figures themselves are are almost identical. I think this is this is one. This is the other one. Uh, it has the, the ways on the other leg though, and I think they would probably be designed to stand on either side of a doorway or something as guardians. Um, it would have also had a, like this thing, the arm is inside a, a, this sort of thing that it would have been attached to a shield. And he would have been holding a spear, like there, right there, a spear would be in his hand. And this one would have held a spear that was vertical, right here, and the spear is gone. Okay, so, uh, Here's a picture seen from the back. Uh, look at the, the hand, the uh, uh, veins and things on the hand, the twist of the body, the asymmetry of the body. Really wonderful and, and, and perfect, uh, but it gets better. <laughs> Uh, they're still not in completely in the in the in, in the top end of the of the classical range. But we'll 
We'll get to that next time.